Mike Coons Jr. of Seattle. And this is seven-year-old Matthew Wyatt, son of an army sergeant based in Hawaii. Two different families with something in common. Both will probably lose their sons to AIDS. Mike and Matthew are hemophiliacs. Their lives depend on injections of products derived from blood. The day that we told him, I remember Michael looked over at me and he says, you mean I have AIDS? And I told him yes. And he wanted to know, he says, does it mean I'm going to die? And what do you tell a child? It's a nightmare that's affected roughly 10,000 Americans. They're all hemophiliacs who've been infected with the HIV virus because the blood products they used in the early 80s were contaminated. So far, over a thousand of them have died, many of them children. And now, some say the companies selling these products were warned of the dangers early on, but didn't respond until it was too late. And that leaves a very chilling question. Did all of these people have to die? How many cases do you need? How many AIDS cases do you need? That's what Centers for Disease Control scientist Don Francis says he told blood industry officials way back in January of 1983 that AIDS could be transmitted through blood products. I was slamming my fist on the desk saying, uh, aren't we going to do anything or are we just going to leave? And apparently we all just left. Tom Dries was an executive for one of the manufacturers and remembers the reaction of others in the blood industry. I think the first reaction was fear that it was true. Uh, then I think uh, rather typically uh, the reaction was, oh, no, it, no, probably not. You know, you, you don't want it to be true because it was going to obviously have and did have a huge effect on the uh, industry. And on the donor pool, because where did companies get some of their blood? The people who used IV drugs, the people who um, were homosexuals, the prostitutes in the inner city. Well, those were the precise people who the blood industry had been relying upon for their product. In December of 1983, the FDA recommended screening out high-risk donors by testing for hepatitis, a possible indicator of AIDS. Manufacturers instead proposed a task force to study the FDA's recommendation. According to an internal memo from one blood products company, Cutter, that task force was a delaying tactic. In the meantime, more hemophiliacs were getting AIDS-infected blood products. I don't think anybody was killing them on purpose, uh, uh, but they were trying to keep their business going. They were trying to keep the hemophiliacs alive. Uh, and, and at the same time, they were trying to make sure that they didn't reduce their profit. In fact, the National Hemophilia Foundation never suggested that manufacturers cease production. The problem here is that people with hemophilia needed these blood products to control bleeding episodes. So here we were caught in this terrible irony of being caught between this rock and this hard place. The risk of bleeding to death was more serious than the risk of getting infected with HIV then. At that time, that is exactly what we thought. But Brownstein didn't mention that the National Hemophilia Foundation is funded in part by blood products manufacturers. And critics say that makes it an ineffective watchdog. A lack of pressure from any agency may be why companies delayed attaching a warning. In this 1982 internal memo, a Cutter executive suggests that an AIDS warning be included in order to avoid inevitable litigation. But that warning didn't appear for more than a year. In the meantime, Mike Coons received a blood product as a preventative measure when his tonsils were taken out. His parents say if they had known what the blood companies knew, they would never have allowed its use. People not only knew, but they knew well in advance enough that Michael's life could have been saved. I feel like Michael would, and a lot of other hemophiliacs uh, were slaughtered for money. Congressman Ron Wyden was part of a 1990 House investigation into blood safety. He says the drug companies were not the only ones at fault, that the Food and Drug Administration failed to properly regulate the industry and encouraged manufacturers to ignore the CDC's dire warnings. Of the FDA's role, Wyden has this to say. Certainly, uh, what we saw uh, in the uh, early and, and middle 80s was shocking. They refused to follow up on the recommendations of the Centers for Disease Control. They worked together uh, with the industry, for example, to uh, uh, try to hold off 
uh, strong regulatory uh, action. No one at the FDA would speak to us on camera, but a spokesperson told Inside Edition in a letter that the FDA took every action considered reasonable by the medical and scientific community. By 1984, it was becoming obvious that people were contracting AIDS from blood products. Companies began heating blood products to kill the virus, but one manufacturer, Armor, heated its products at lower temperatures than others. Experts told us that higher temperatures, while effective at killing the virus, can also destroy more of the blood product or change its composition. Virologist Alfred Prince was hired by Armour to check their heating process. He says he told Armour low temperatures only killed 90 to 99 percent of the virus. Killing 99 percent of a million still, still leaves 10,000 10, infectious doses left. After you'd completed your research and reported your findings back to Armour, did you feel that yours was a message they wanted to hear? Well, certainly not. They were told by other people that they had a wonderful process. We said it wasn't a wonderful process. In fact, he says Armour told him not to publish his results, and the company continued to heat their products at a lower temperature. Mike Wyatt says his son used heat-treated Armour blood product, and when his son tested positive in 1986, he called the company. You want to give me some information about this? Talk to me. Let me know what's going on. And all I got is we have no information on that, and it could not have been our product. Finally, in 1987, three years after Dr. Prince's findings, Armour withdrew its heat-treated blood products. We asked both Armour and Cutter for interviews, but both companies refused, citing pending litigation. Armour did agree to answer some of our questions in writing, though they would not comment on Dr. Prince's findings that their heat treatment was ineffective. They told us that despite the uncertainties of how the virus was transmitted in the early 80s, they had acted responsibly. In support, they told us there have been no judgments against Armour or other concentrate manufacturers in these cases. But the Wyatts are one of two families Inside Edition found who settled with Armour out of court under conditions that prohibit them from discussing the settlement. Since 1987, all blood companies have used new methods that make their blood products safe. But no reassurance will ever be enough for Mike Kuhn's mother, who has two other boys with hemophilia. Because I couldn't handle it if another one of my children got AIDS and had to go through the pain and suffering that Michael has to go through and that these little kids have to go through. It is estimated that between 50 and 80 percent of the hemophiliac population has the HIV virus truly a national tragedy.